In this throwback episode, we look at the best stories from 2014. The Vancouver Men's Chorus sings the hits. Connie takes on anti-bullying. And back to World Pride with Venus Rising. Welcome to Outlook TV. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And I'm Dan Doomchoff. This is the Queer News Magazine show that brings you queer stories from coast to coast that matter the most. And we are going to be taking you on a flashback trip this episode. We're going to go back to a bunch of our very favoritest of our stories. And the first one is an Angus Prot story about the Vancouver Men's Chorus. The Vancouver Men's Chorus is one of LGBT Vancouver's most respected and beloved organizations. Tonight we're going to have the chance to go behind the scenes backstage as they're preparing for their number one hit series. Let's go check it out. something you've done before or is it, this is a new adventure for you? The producing is new to me. I've helped in back in you know backstage before but uh, the co-producing is brand new so it's been it's been a learning experience but it's great. The Vancouver Men's Chorus has a great infrastructure and a lot of experience that helps helped us through so it's been good. We've, we've spent a lot of time working with the choreographers and making sure they've got what they need for uh, the various pieces to make the show look fabulous. So, um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of dance, there's a lot of choreography in this show, so um, it's, it's been fun. What is your role and what is your responsibility, for example? Well, it's just about everything, but it's, it, mainly it's just sort of keeping the organization running. We have a very, very efficient board of directors. We have eight guys in the chorus who work very hard in various portfolios. And I chair meetings. I try to be involved in all aspects of the chorus and get to know the guys on a personal level and professional level. I also do a lot of um, work with fundraising and getting to know the community, donors, and, and stuff like that. Actually, we're quite a little show choir these days. We have a lot of new young members who really like to get up and dance, and uh, we have two great in-house choreographers at the present time. And um, usually each concert period, we have six to eight songs in each of the shows that are choreographed fully, not only with the dancers, but with the choir as well. I understand you have a very exciting show coming up very shortly. Can you give us a little bit of overview about what we can expect in this show? Right, well, we're doing number one hits, so it is, uh, well, it's a lot of surprise number one hits. It may not just be all the uh, shares and Madonnas uh, you might expect, but also some uh, classical music and some international music. We're actually singing in seven languages, so it's uh, it's pretty diverse, number one hits. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing, seven languages. Uh-huh, yeah, we're doing some Hindi, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, um, see, Latin, English, yeah. For Outlook TV, this is Angus Prot. And up next, we're going to take you to Children 404. It's a film that uh, aired at the Vancouver Film Festival. And breaking news, Justin Romanoff, the kind of protagonist of this movie, got granted asylum in Canada today. What a perfect one to replay for us with this bit of news. Here's Children 404. The Russian LGBT teen website Children 404 is the subject of a documentary and we spoke with co-director Askwald Kuryov about making the film Children 404. As soon as I come to school, they start ramming it into our heads that people like me have no right to live. L. 17, St. Petersburg. Pavel Laparov, who is co-director of Children 404, sent me a message on Facebook, asked me if I want to make a documentary about LGBT people. We met Yelena Klimova, who is the founder of uh, this online group. We went uh, to her uh, own town. She trusted us and uh, she, she helped us a lot with this researching for, for young people who, who is ready for interview. And uh, at that moment, more than 700 uh, children sent her their stories to share it in online group. And 78 of them answered that they are ready 
for interview, but finally we made uh, 45 uh, anonymous interviews with these children uh, and uh, some of them uh, uh, filmed for, for this documentary. They filmed using their um, phones or, or iPads, uh, they filmed their own space, their rooms, their way to school. When I met um, main, main subject, Pasha, Justin, and when I knew his story, when I find out that he's going to, to leave Russia and to move to Canada, I realized that this is the, the subject and, and I realized how we can make this movie. I know there's some gay teenagers, some uh, gay people who did a suicide in Russia. I know three guys between 16 to 20 years old who did a suicide because of they're gay because it can didn't have support in government and the school. Sometimes we we have a, a very good feedback from from children uh, when they they tell uh, how it helped them to accept themselves and. Uh, uh, sometimes we have uh, feedback from parents who tell us uh, how, how this film helped them to accept their children. It was our main goal uh, to help um, the children and their parents with this problem. I'm going to be a politician. I'll be the one to repeal this stupid law. Anonymous. Up next in our travel back through the favorite stories of 2014 brings us to our visit to Toronto for World Pride. And Logan takes us to Unicorn Born. I'm Logan Alexander and we're here at the finale of Gender Fest to check out Unicorn Born. Unicorn Born is an all genders dance party that takes place during Pride weekend. It's a very inclusive space. We make sure that it's more physically accessible. We have a wheelchair accessibility. It's for all genders, so we have a lot of transgender presence in the party. We have a lot of people who are all along the gender spectrum, and everyone comes together in this space to have a great time. One of the reasons why it's important to have an all genders party at Pride is so that the community can come together and everyone can meet each other and we can all work together as one movement to celebrate and to be activists together. Would you be able to explain the relationship between Unicorn Born and Genderfest? Genderfest is an all genders festival that takes place over about two weeks before Pride and we have a lot of different events that take place and then Unicorn Born is the final event. It's the uh, Pride Sunday dance party that we have and it's a, the biggest event of Genderfest. Unicorn Born is this like long overdue expression of trans pride in a really festive, celebrating, awesome way as trans people and cis people and straight people and gay people and bi people all hanging out and having a good time. It's a lot about friends. It's also about knowing that like friends of mine with mobility issues can show up, friends of mine who don't have a lot of money can show up, like people with various barriers can all show up at one party. I'm here with the buddy system. I'm coordinating for the evening. There's a group of volunteers who all have these uh, brightly colored wristbands uh, to identify themselves as sober buddies. And so we do various things. We supply free water. We're arranging for a free ride home if people need it tonight. We have safe sex supplies, um, rolling papers, lighters, tampons, you name it. We have it in our backpack. Um, so yeah, we, we do all sorts of harm reduction here, uh, so everyone has a safe, fun time. Well, we just finished checking out Unicorn Born, and my senses are overwhelmed. For Outlook TV, I'm Logan Alexander. And now we're going to have to take just a little break. That's right, I've got a big audition for the Santa Claus Parade. And up next, it looks like there are some floats going by. Welcome back. You're watching Outlook TV. Thanks, Rebecca. For this next story, we are going to continue at World Pride, where I interviewed Venus for Venus Rising. Uh -huh. 
Well, here we are in World Pride at the Bud Light South Stage, where Rising Venus is about to start. This is House of Venus's 20th anniversary, and they are bringing it on, and it is hot. Let's check it out. What can audiences expect tonight here at Venus Rising? Well, an out-of-this-world performance. We've had a lot of shows going on already. Some local, we're getting ready for some of our international talent, which we're so excited about. Hercules and Love Affair, and Peaches, and local entertainment. Uh, Betty Ford from the legendary kind of girl rap rock uh, band called Stink Med, and, and DJ Dickie Doo, who's the original um, DJ maestro for the House of Venus. And I understand this is a big year for House of Venus, the 20th anniversary? It's true, this is our 20th anniversary. We have had 20 years of the House of Venus being Canada's like original sort of drag house, film house, fashion house, and art house. So we're so excited to be a part of World Pride and we're celebrating here with the Venus Rising stage. We're so excited! This is the 20th anniversary. Yes. What does that mean to you? You have to remember at the end of the day how much has changed for the better overall. Alexi, what do you have to do with House of Venus? Well, House of Venus is the mother house of all love. It's the intergalactic planetary of graciousness and gorgeousness. House of Venus has uh, represented um, gay, queer, and trans communities so appropriately. They have been all about love, and especially for the trans community, because we've always felt discluded from a lot of things. And um, I know um, Mother Venus, Miss Cotton, she's always um, been a loving arm and has extended herself to be so kind and gracious. That's what the House of Venus is about. Here we are with Peaches as she's getting ready for her big show. Uh, what's a World Pride message that you've got? More boobs. We need more boobs. That's my big World Pride message, y'all. We need more boobs. boobs. You heard it here first. Great t-shirt. I know. So we have a song called Board of Rob Ford and I really wanted to wear an Olivia Chow t-shirt because I'm obviously a big supporter of her. I feel like you can't just bitch about something, you have to be proactive as well, right? What uh, world pride message do you have for our viewers out there? We have come so far since, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say exactly how old I am. It, it's been amazing over 25 years to see how far we've come to see that World Pride is a big festival that everybody in the city, except for one person who isn't here, thankfully, um, supports and gets behind. From here in the heart of Toronto at the World Pride celebration, it's been amazing to watch the House of Venus celebrate their 20th anniversary by bringing love and joy to all these people. For Outlook TV, I'm Dan Doomshaw. Back to me. And up next, we're going to recap when we send Connie back to school. That's right. Who better to talk about anti-bullying than a six-foot-tall drag queen? Oh, hi, kittens. It's your intrepid reporter, the unstoppable Connie Smudge, here in deepest Deep Cove on the North Shore of Vancouver. <sighs> kittens, I have the most ultimate experience for you today. Not only am I going to a high school where they are celebrating all of our differences, Seco Secondary here in Deep Cove, but Jenna Talakova is going to be there. We're going to speak to some of the organizers, and they've created a huge assembly of all their students, 800 plus students from grade 8 to 12. We're going to make an impact today, kittens, and I can't wait for you to join along our journey. Come on, let's go, okay? I'm ready! Here I am with the fabulous Dr. Overgaard. He is the principal here at Seacove Secondary. How are you, sir? I'm great. I'm excited for today. I'm absolutely vibrating with anticipation. I really am. Good. And I think the whole school is. It's uh, going to be a really important, meaningful day for us where we're looking at transgendered issues and really trying to promote acceptance and community. I'm getting more emotionally stronger, more confident with myself, and all around able to progress. Tell me what you think about this GSA and how it's helping these kids in their life. I think the GSA club is really central to the school because these students, and this is our second year that we've done a GSA assembly, to, yeah. and uh, they, their sense of really wanting to create a, an environment and a community where there is acceptance for all students, no matter uh, whether they're a student with special needs, whether they're a student with a different sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. We need to accept everybody and appreciate and, and, and include everyone 
in our community. And, and that is what I feel really important about this community. It is acceptance of everyone. Tell me how, how this group all ensued, how it all started. Um, it started about seven years ago as a group of three people. Mm. And they were people who identified as gay or lesbian and just really wanted to be a part of changing the culture at our school that was more understanding about LGBTQ issues. What part is this fabulous group and what are we doing? Um, this is the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance at Seacove, and we are having an assembly to raise awareness on gender identity and transgendered issues. Here's one of Ms. Yo's star students, Bruce Proudfoot, giving a most enlightening, insightful, and entertaining speech. Hi, so I think you all know me. My name's Bruce, in case you didn't. I'm in grade 12, I'm gay, and I like the color blue. When you're young, people always tell you that you can be whatever you want if you try hard enough. I took this very literally. I pushed being gay as far out of my mind as I could. I would tell myself it's just a phase, I would make homophobic comments to distance myself from it, and I even went as far as to date several girls. Sorry about that. <laughs> My uncle, he was gay, and he always had a really difficult time. He's like, he would be 40 this year, so he always had a difficult time growing up, so this is definitely something that hits pretty close to home. You are more than the flesh stretched over your bones or the amount of space that you take up around you. You're more than the color of your eyes or the freckles on your cheeks. You are the strength that it takes to get out of bed in the morning. I love your generation so much more than mine because I find that you're way more open-minded about just letting people be who they are. I find that we're so lucky to live in Canada when there's other countries who are taking steps backwards, whereas we're really moving forward with Bill 279 trying to get passed and everything right now. I just feel like we're really fortunate. I got really caught up with like trying to be with the cool kids because I was accepted from my high school and, and it just went downhill from there. I mean, I needed to learn it, but I, I went through it all. I went through the partying, the drugs, you know, dropping out, all of these things I never tell anybody. And um, I lost myself, and then I picked myself back up. And, um, and now I'm here today. This is your intrepid reporter, the unstoppable Cunny Smudge, reporting from Deep Cove for Outlook TV. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take just a wee little break now. That's right. So do your wee little thing and join us back here for the best of 2014. Welcome back. You're watching Outlook TV. And for this flashback, we're going to take you to Scott McInnes in Toronto. That's right. While he was there, he went to an exhibition of Francis Bacon's work. I'm Scott McInnes here for Outlook TV. And today we're at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto for the opening of the new exhibition Francis Bacon and Henry Moore, Terror and Beauty. This exhibition deals with themes of suffering and survival and marks the first time that Francis Bacon's work will be exhibited to the Canadian public. The first room that has art in the exhibition has Moore's drawings, Henry Moore's drawings, that were done during the Blitz. The Blitz, World War II, was an extraordinary time in London. Nobody was expecting the Blitz to happen. It was full-on bombing from September 1940 to May 1941. People were going into the London Underground, which is very deep in London, it's hugely deep, to protect themselves overnight. And Henry Moore saw this, he was on the train coming home on the fourth night of the bombing, and saw these people lying on the platform and was astounded. Uh, well, number one, he thought they looked like a row of Henry Moore sculptures. But number two, the fact that people were living this way, surviving this way. So we've paired drawings. He eventually became um, a war artist and actually did went night after night and then from memory did the sketches. When you go into the next room, you'll go past a Henry Moore sculpture, which people think of Henry Moore's women as being perhaps nurturing and about fertility and so on. This particular reclining sculpture that you'll see, which was just done just after the war, is skeletal. 
um, and the, the faces, she's, she's got her face up and it's like a scream. Now remember that, you know, as soon as the war ended, they, people started seeing images of the Holocaust and there was rationing. So this art has come from a horror show. Right behind it is a magnificent vacant triptych, um, which he first did, it was um, Stations of the Cross, I can't remember, he first did it in 1944. In 1988, when he was 78 years old, he redid this painting, and it's a triptych, so it's three panels with these strange creatures. Now, it's not the crucifixion, it's a crucifixion. Both Moore and Bacon were staunch, vehement atheists. Um, but they chose to use religious symbolism as something you could hang all sorts of emotion on. And what they quoted, both of them said, it's man's inhumanity to man is symbolized by the crucifixion. Francis Bacon was famously an out gay artist throughout the 20th century. Uh, can you speak a little on how his sexuality may have influenced his work? Well, his whole life was influenced by his sexuality. He was born to a Protestant family in Dublin, um, upper class, rather cold parents, and knew he was homosexual when he was quite young, I think. His parents disapproved, his, violent, his father violently disapproved, and actually got the stable hands to beat him in the hopes of beating um, femininity or you know, homosexuality out of him. And in fact, he had his first sexual relations with some of the stable hands. For various reasons, he became sadomasochistic. I'm sure that started, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'm sure that started from his youth. Um, he had various lovers during his life. And he paints his version of reality. Um, and, and his reality, of course, has violence in it. You have to spend time with real art and, and see what responses you get. See what you start feeling when you're looking at it. That's really the point of an art experience. The exhibition runs until July 20th. For more information, visit ago.net. For Outlook TV, I'm Scott McInnes. And next up, still in Toronto, but this time from Gorgeous. He brings us the story of a chorus queen. <laughs> Toronto's top queens in this show, Scarlet Bobo, Fahrenheit, Bunny Le Pen, Divine Darling, just to name a few of them. We've got guest appearances by some of the bigger names out there as well, Safonda so Cox, Brooklyn Heights, you never know what, which night they're going to appear at. But overall, we've got a great two-hour show, ready to go. Let me see that. This is it. This is what we've been waiting for. The Moulin Rouge Paris. The story is, tells the tale of three queens uh, seeking stardom on a bigger stage and leaving their sort of dirty, uh, crummy bar behind them. And uh, as we follow the story, they actually start auditioning for roles at the Moulin Rouge in Paris. She's dead. Yes, um, well, I play the character Dee Dee, who is the, the ingenue coming up, uh, kind of a little nervous, doesn't realize um, her, her own potential and trusts her girls to kind of get her through the journey that is the show and, uh, and make sure that she, she gets to the end and see what happens. It's Well, I'm playing Veronica in the musical, and I'm one of the older queens between the three girls. I'm the one that try to keep them together and make sure that everything is okay with us and try to focus on what is and which is going to be like this little audition. Uh, absolutely amazing. Everybody loved it, and I got these guys. Absolutely. And uh, what can we expect in tonight's show? We'll be here filming the whole thing. What do we look for? More Tons of amazing men. Yeah. So much fabulous. Fabulous. So many everywhere. So Amazing. many things. Feathers, great dance. Glitter high everywhere. Doors, high kicks.
most importantly, the entire show is a fundraiser for the Toronto People with AIDS Foundation. Uh, all net proceeds are being donated to that charity. Yeah. It makes you feel as though you're literally giving back something to the community and supporting something that is very close to a lot of us at home. Whether you're gay, trans, bisexual, whatever the case may be, it's something that we hold dearly close to us that has been an epidemic in our community and we just it's just really fun to raise funds for something like that. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for this flashback episode, but fear not, there'll be another one. Thank you for tuning in, and from all of us here at Outlook TV, we wish you, your family, and your chosen families a happy holidays. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And I'm Dan Doomshaw. And remember, stay fabulous, Canada. Canada.